Welcome back to the Talking About Practice podcast. I'm your host, AJ Giuliani, and I'm so excited today to have with us Zaretta Hammond. She is the author of Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, Promoting Authentic Engagement and Rigor Among Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Students. She's not just an author of a book, as she says, and we look at continues to impact uh, the landscape of education, uh, but she's a former uh, classroom English teacher like myself, which is exciting to kind of talk about. And she's been doing uh, instructional design, school coaching, professional development uh, for the past 18 years. Uh, she's uh, been on the National Education Reform Organization's uh, National Equity Project, the former Bay Area School Reform Collaborative, and she does work every single day around the idea of practice, specifically in culturally responsive teaching. Thanks again for being on the podcast, Loretta. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to have you on and, and really see your definition of what practice looks like in your work. One of the things we, we talk about on this podcast a lot is that practice as a term and has a lot of different kind of uses, right? Uh, in sports, it means one thing. In our life, it means another thing. In business, it means one thing. And uh, I just kind of wanted to open up by asking you, what? how do you define practice in your work and in your life? What does that actually look like? Yeah, I define practice as uh, getting better, right? The, the path toward mastery around something that feels really, really important. So for educators or adults, you know, we want to get good at something. And so in order to do that, you need to practice. But I think uh, we have a lot of misconceptions about practice. And similarly, you know, we want children to be good learners and to develop skills. Um, and sometimes it's not just knowing stuff, but it's being able to actually um, understand it, recall it, uh, and be at a higher level. So all of those are some aspect of this simple thing we call practice. Yeah, and, and, and I, I love kind of, um, you know, the simplifying act of, of getting better, right? But what that actually looks like and, and around it. So how did you come into this work, right? Like what is, tell us a little bit about your story, um, what it was like, and kind of how you got down the path of doing this work uh, with culturally responsive teaching? Yeah, I, you know, folks that have read my book, I tell a little bit about my story, but for those that have yet to read it, um, I grew up in San Francisco and I was, uh, my mother was a teen parent who lived in the projects, but she lied about our address and sent us to the neighborhood school where my grandparents were able to buy a house, predominantly white and Asian community. And every day I'd go home and I'd see this kind of uh, gap between the quality of education that was happening in these two communities that I was shuttling back and forth uh, across. Cross. And so it really kind of lit my equity fire. I didn't know what that word was, but there was something I could tell even as a young person that there was just some disparity. Now, what was really interesting is um, my mother eventually was part of one of the first welfare to work programs and they gave her the position of library technician. So my after school program was to come to her library branch in San Francisco and she would pile the table full of books. And she says, when you hit the table, it's time for us to go home. So I remember going through all the books. I mean, is that the best daycare situation? And I just fell in love with, I fell in love with words. I fell in love with reading. I remember the day my mom, uh, I asked her if I could go over to the adult section because I had read everything in the children's section and had just consumed all the new arrivals. And she gave me the kind of the side eye like, mm, I know what's over there in that adult section. But the reality is she acquiesced and allowed me to, to, to start perusing the stacks. And I discovered, uh, you know, astronomy and philosophy and mythology and science and was able to kind of feed my own interest and curiosities and just really started to 
fall in love with books, you know, leap forward when I um, really started to think about education as a path for me. Uh, literacy was my area. And I taught writing when I was in the classroom and really helping students get better at writing. Writing is an interesting discipline because it's not like science where you're covering certain content or math where you're learning formulas. It is a skill. And I had to learn how to help students actually get better. But it meant I under, started to understand something that only the learner learns. So that, you know, part of what I understood and not just my desire to learn, but here's how you get better. Here's how you actually level up your skills, your understanding, so that you actually can do deeper work, more rig rigorous work. So writing, uh, I was a composition teacher when I was in the classroom and really starting to understand how to help students get better. And the particular thing was writing, but it, it translated into all other things. And then eventually, um, because I started to see a lot of students who were not reading on grade level, I started to actually coach teachers and other uh, adults, tutors, uh, parents around reading development, how to help your student become a better reader, your child become a better reader. What are the things we do to help them get better? Not to them, but with them, right? And so, you know, that's how my journey in this work began. So one of the things it, it, I want to emphasize, it didn't begin because I said, oh, I'm going to do some stuff around culturally responsive teaching. I think there are a lot of misconceptions about culturally responsive teaching. It is actually a synergetic methodology made up of four to six really core practices that people just truncate into this, oh, culturally responsive teaching, like it's a thing. So I have a lot of, you know, passion, energy around the way, misconceptions and the way we perpetuate that. So I started to see I can use culture as a cognitive scaffold to help my students get better, to build their schema, to do myelination, to help them actually learn faster. So started to actually leverage that, but it wasn't because I set out, I'm going to be a practitioner of culturally responsive practices, right? You, uh, do you have any insight into how you yourself got better uh, and, oh, yeah. learned, and learned about those practices while you were teaching? What did that look like as a teacher when you realized there was something that you had to, to kind of build up? What did that look like for you? Yeah, I, 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 it meant that I had to, I had this moment, right? I'd come out of my teacher ed program and all the techniques and had taken my methods classes and I remember sitting with a student, Adam, right? Even all these many years ago, decades at this point, I remember sitting with him and conferencing, having our writing conference. And I could not get him to really understand that he was making these consistent errors, right? Run-on sentences, comma splices. And, you know, I could use all the red ink in the world, but he was just like, I, I don't really understand what I'm doing wrong here. And I had this epiphany that if I couldn't get him to see, not just see the mistake and learn how to correct it, because that's what a lot of what we do, but to actually think about his learning moves, right. that I couldn't help him get better because only the learner learns. So after that epiphany, I, you know, unbeknownst to me and to Adam, <laughs> <laughs> that meant that we had to do some practice. And the way I broke practice down is I needed to help him internalize some information. Yep. Then I needed to help him yep. practice that, right? But the practicing, and I think this is a piece that educators really get wrong, that practice requires feedback. So just doing the same thing over and over is not practice. I love that. And unfortunately... Too many educators think, oh, let's just keep doing it. But if no one gives you corrective feedback, all you're doing is reinforcing bad habits or misconceptions, right? And so there has to be a feedback loop in there. And that feedback loop has to not just be right or wrong. There are different types of feedback that you have to give. And that feedback has to come in a timely fashion. It's got to be actionable. 
and it's got to help you see where the gap is, where your gap analysis, where are you on the road to actually mastering that? So if you can't give people that feedback, kind of like GPS, Siri to, to, you know, and here's, you know, and then we go past our exit. She's like rerouting, right? right? So that feedback, right? She tells us you're getting close, you're getting close. Oh, nope, you passed it. If our young people don't get that, they can't get better. So I knew I had to do that. I had to get, um, you know, mentors, a uh, group of other educators who were trying to get better as well. So we could be thinking about that. So I could take my, my practice and kind of open it up and be in conversation and collaboration with others. Um, and so it meant, you know, I had to have conditions that made that happen. Sometimes it's hard for teachers to get. And I think we forget what a true professional learning community should be about, right? It should yeah. be getting better. So um, I, it was really in the service of teaching writing effectively, not just the techniques, but helping students actually use them yeah. and improve that I started to understand about practice and the need for opportunities for students to do things over check to see am i getting closer and if they weren't what did i need to adjust and so practice has a lot of different pieces to it here's the other piece i'd say is really important there's a social emotional piece to practice as well yeah meaning i have to be okay with being bad because in the beginning when we're getting good at something we are conscious of how bad we are yeah. right it's called yeah conscious incompetence, right? And at first we're just unconscious of our incompetence until it becomes important to us. Oh, I can't do that, but I really want to get better. Now I'm knee deep in this conscious incompetence. I suck at this and you're probably going to suck for a minute, right? But if we can't emotionally move through that as part of learning, not as some, you know, uh, um, Thing that says I'm bad at this, right? Or I can't get it, um, or I'm not capable, right? There's so many messages connected to that because we want instant, you know, application. We want instant mastery. Uh, so helping people actually move through conscious incompetence is really important. I call it the first pancake, right? The theory of the first pancake. You know, we make pancakes, we've all made pancakes, either as parents or as kids, we've been on the receiving end or the making end. And there's something about the, the process of pancake making. So, you know, you're making the pancakes, you might have your plate, you know, people are waiting for those uh -huh. pancakes to come off the griddle. Now, mm -hmm. here's the reality. That first pancake is just messed up. Mm -hmm. It's runny and beige on one side, it's gooey, and, and, and on the other side, it's crunchy and burnt, right? Nobody's upset. The cook says, oh, I need to adjust. Feedback loop. I need to thin out that batter. Everybody's just waiting. Now, that first pancake goes to the dog, the baby, the garbage, wherever. The and then everybody's like, yeah, the good stuff's coming. Yep that we have to reimagine what does it mean to move through conscious incompetence. And I, I invoke the first pancake when I'm working with other educators and I encourage them to do that with their kids. Ron Rickard, making thinking, author of Making Thinking Visible, he says that you have to have social cognitive norms in the classroom. We love our behavioral norms, mm -hmm. but we don't have any norms of cognition and learning. He says, one of those would be errors or information, not confirmation of low intelligence. I love that. I love that. And you, so you're going through this process yourself. You're kind of making your own first pancake, right? As, as a learner and, um, and you come to this point where I'm assuming, and, and I don't necessarily want to assume, but you found something that works, right? You have these four to six practices that are working with kids that you are working with. And at some point in time, we go from doing it with our students to now 
helping other educators, helping other people in their practice to do it. What did that look like in your journey going from working with the kids? And you probably were doing both, right? Working with the kids and educators. But what did that look like? How did you take what worked in the classroom, those four to six practices that we talked about, and actually translate that into professional learning? So the biggest challenge that I saw um, it were number one conditions. So when I came out and started to do, and you're right, for a time it was, you know, doing both. And eventually I came out of my, having my own classroom and really just started working with uh, adults. Um, But I found that I was much more frustrated than having my own classroom because there have to be conditions of practice. So I call it the dojo right? That the dojo, when you start to think about martial arts, there's a space that people come into and it's padded. It's set up for that kind of thing. We have very few dojos for adults in their learning, meaning we don't help them getting social emotionally ready for that first pancake because they feel that they're fearing evaluation. Um, many don't have coaches who are giving them feedback. So the feedback loop is not there. Many don't have time. So there, what I ran up against wasn't just how do I take these techniques I've used with kids and use them with adults is how do I actually, to begin with, find the right conditions. I found very few districts, very few school leaders that were actually creating the conditions, even what they call PLCs right now. Mm. No, it's like, let's, Not a joke. let's talk about data, right? I mean, that's, that's what most of them are, right? That's it. Let's just talk about it. Throw some spreadsheets. Out. That's right. That, and, and the idea that we are actually using some time of, of, of collaborative action research or inquiry to actually figure out how we apply this. Because here's the thing. There is a way in which we keep thinking, oh, what are the four things you did with adults? Well, the reality is, this is where, even when we talk about culturally responsive, the operative word, the first word we should focus on is not the culture, but the responsive. Who's the person in front of me? So I first have to understand that person as a learner, but I can't get that close, right, until I have some relationship where they let down a little of the facade. So practice right? Getting to the point where practice and you're you're recognizing I'm not good as I want to be yet comes with vulnerability. So the relationship becomes key. How do I get close enough to have some cognitive insight so that I can pick the right tool so that I can see where you need to strengthen? Your kick is good, but when you rebound, right? So that coaches that second pair of eyes and the teacher has to be that the leader has to be that for teachers. If you're just doing walkthroughs and you're just dinging folks for not having something on the board or not, then the teacher gets and starts to believe that there's no practice, right? That this is all just evaluative versus there's feedback for me to get better. That there's a culture of getting better and moving toward mastery. This is how we manage as adults, conscious incompetence. We hold each other up. This is why the collaborative inquiry process becomes so critical. I see some districts doing PDSA cycles, right? And the reality is when they are doing or trying to implement a new strategy, it's all about the strategy, not about the kids. Right. And so right. part of the practice in working with adults is actually helping them understand how we get better at things. Um, So because that's not something they quite understand coming out of their education um, prep, uh, teacher prep program. So, you know, uh, part of my work these days is how do we get good at stuff? Helping them create the right conditions, helping them talk about it, helping them manage their own social emotional stuff so that they actually can tolerate that conscious incompetence until they move on the other side of it. And when we embrace it and actually lean into it, that's how we get better faster. I, I, I love this uh, so much. And it, it brings up something that I've been thinking about <clears throat> a lot around the term practice, which is, and I really want to ask you this, can people get better? Students, players, adults, 
Can adults get better at something if they don't want to? Meaning, um, you know, they, they don't <laughs> want to have the conversation. They don't want to have the feedback. They don't necessarily want to learn new strategies, those different types of mm -hmm. things. Your work that, and, and your research and that you're doing with those reluctant learners, mm -hmm. those reluctant adults, what does that look like? So I think that, you know, and I'm going to say something that's <laughs> a little controversial, right? But it grows out of kind of the, the science of uh, change, right? Change management, how people change. Um, and it's linked to Roger's diffusion of innovation. They use it a lot in uh, advertising and marketing. We use it a lot in corporate life. Um, but a lot of these ideas have not uh, permeated uh, education and they should and Roger's uh, diffusion of innovation it's a it's a shape like a bell curve and what he says is at the very front about three percent of the people are mavericks and trying new things open to change they'll do it even before it's fully formed right we know those people like they're they're the first ones on David they're sitting in their lawn chairs waiting for that new Apple phone even though they know it's full of bugs right I want to be the first yeah. <laughs> absolutely we know those people but there is something that says they're so far out that they don't have a lot of influence right then there's the early adopters and the early majority and this is about 13 percent 34 percent of folks that really will start to help us um, navigate change right they'll embrace it they have done their social emotional work to be okay with conscious incompetence uh and they'll move through it and they'll start to show other people and they'll infect others with their intellectual curiosity that others start to come aboard at the tail end of this is 16 percent that rogers called the resistant minority there is a way in which we want to focus on that resistant minority. Can a person change who is reluctant? If you help them find their investment in wanting to be better, particularly for adults, right? If they wanna keep their paycheck, maybe that's enough of a motivator, <laughs> right? If they want to be in community with others, maybe that's a motivator. You have to, this is where the social, emotional, and the uh, motivational, coupled with the change in cognition, right? Us getting better at something is not something that can be mandated because it requires an internal set of processes that is both cognition and emotional as well as technique, right? And you can't just can't mandate that. Some people have their own mental models and this is why the work is really layered. If I have a mental model of what it means to be good at something or why something won't work, if I don't shift that mental model, that I'm not going to do the thing. I saw that with reading. If the teacher didn't believe the child was capable of reading yeah. or capable of more rigorous learning, she never gave that student that, you know, more challenging text to read. Um, because she's like, why would I do that? I don't think that student can do it. If I don't think I can change, why would I engage in what will be painful and possibly embarrassing, yeah. right? Teachers, they, they, are, they don't want to be seen as incompetent. And if you haven't created that culture, then it becomes harder. So I do think, you know, leaders have a big role here to play. How have you created a dojo that has getting better as the goal but getting better because we start with the process of moving from conscious incompetence and we have fun at it right when those emotions are engaged then we generate dopamine dopamine is our brain's process that makes us want to do hard things it makes us want to continue and if we don't code <clears throat> code the various activities in schools with more dopamine teachers won't engage in them because we're we're actually putting the coding with cortisol i'm going to be dinged i'm going to be written up i'm not doing it somebody's judging me i love that i mean i love the uh, the notion that it is really in the in the neuroscience there right the cortisol versus mm -hmm. the, the dopamine i i'm interested and i'm just continuing on this point because i've had a lot of conversations around this recently what happens when we have um these folks that have 
taken that first step that have, uh, you know, uh, made their first pancake and they've struggled with it and they continue to practice. And, um, and I see this a lot and then they don't see themselves getting better. And, and a lot of times it's because maybe they're not practicing the right ways. They don't know the exact techniques. They're just working hard, right? I can't tell you, you know, how many teachers I talk to um, or how many school leaders I talk to, or how many coaches I talk to, and they're working really hard. Like, I, you know, I think a lot of times we maybe discredit. These people are working really hard, but maybe they're not doing necessarily the right things <laughs> what you kind of mentioned those four to six things what are those those things that work and and you've seen work and the research has supported that work what is what does that look like well i think a couple of things right so you're right we work too hard and the reason we're working harder is we have too many things so there's a thing the first thing is attentional density and what this means is we get better when we focus our attention. And so being able to focus your attention means you've got to say no to something. You've got to let go. And you have to have the focused effort around getting better. This is the aspect called deliberate practice, right? Musicians, we see musicians as they get better. There might be one small piece, one arm movement, you know, one uh free throw or stance and the coach will work with them on that one movement because that one movement is what leveling up is. So leveling up is not, I got to do all 10 things. There is a way in which we have not helped teachers understand what does it mean to get better? So it means we take one small thing that has high leverage potential because if I get this, some other things will start to fall in place. We can call it a lead domino. So that attentional density has to be there. Then we have to give the feedback. Who's giving teachers feedback? And it cannot be the principal, I'm gonna come in every two or three weeks <laughs> with a clipboard and you have no, and then walks out at what, what, what just happened, right? <laughs> that is not feedback, right? So what that means is you have to either have peer coaches or you have to have an instructional coach who can be your other pair of eyes. And sometimes we have to self-coach. If you don't have that, then you need to set up a videotape, right? What, or maybe you do audio tape. What are, what, what's happening during that period of instruction that I want to get better at? What am I saying? You know, maybe you're just telling who's doing most of the talking, right? Because here's the thing. We, Self-report is 100%. I'm doing everything. It's, it's going great until somebody shows us it's not, right? Sure, yeah. And so sometimes we don't see our own progress, right? And there, that's the other piece that we continue when we see progress. The brain actually has this thing called the progress principle. It's why we love our Fitbits and our pedometers. You will actually hang in there longer when you see that you're making incremental progress. Yeah. So where are we starting to see that? We love to do this with kids, chart your fluency, chart, chart but we don't do this with adults. Right. Right? How right. many times, how can you change these things? What are the three things you need to change? Leaders don't give that detailed feedback. And for teachers who know they want to get better at a certain aspect of instruction, you know, maybe it's how do I hook the student's curiosity? I call it igniting. Or how do I get students to chew on their content so I'm not doing all the cognitive work in the classroom, right? I want to get better at that. Okay. You're going to have to set up your own inquiry. You're going to have to set up your own practice. Then you're going to have to tape record or audio tape so that you have a baseline. Because if you don't know where you're starting, you don't know if you're progressing. And therein lies the real challenge. So we have attentional density. you got to pay attention to fewer things. Yeah. You have deliberate practice. What's the small but high leverage thing? What, where are you going to get your feedback? Right. So these are critical things. And, you know, being able to set that up in a school setting in many ways is antithetical. We don't create schools as dojos for teacher learning. You know, we, we should stop with the nine, you know, month academic year. The th that two and a half months, teachers should get full pay, and that's their dojo time. 
That's our time to get better together, right? We can do lesson study. I love lesson study because it is a structured process for actually getting better doing a thing. So I think those are the sorts of things that we have to help teachers understand. First, the process of what does it mean to get better? Right. What is deliberate practice? What is conscious incompetence? How do we move to uh, conscious competence? Because sometimes that's no, but I need to be more than proficient when I'm leading young people through their you know, literacy development. And then how do I move to that next level? So I do think we have, we're going to have to reimagine how schools are structured if we truly want teachers, all teachers, particularly those that are the late majority. Okay, this is just the direction we're going. A lot of teachers try to wait what they call the fad. Oh, that's just what we're doing. I'm, I, I'm just going to wait it out. I won't do it. Right? We have a lot of autonomy when we close our classroom door. You know, a lot of teachers don't feel that. And they ask me a lot of times, well, you know, their district is saying, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a radical here. Close your door. Was the last time a district person came to your classroom? Do what you need to do in service of those children. But this also means getting together with other adults and being honest with yourself as to what part of the instructional process you don't feel good enough at yet, right? So being able to like, ah, I'm okay at that, but kids really need me to be good at that. That's a critical part of helping a young person get to the next level of mastery or to develop their cognitive, you know, internal cognitive structures or have a, a, a higher level academic conversation, right? I had to learn that when I had to figure out how to help students see the writing mistakes how do I help you internalize what good writing should be? And how do I help you make those corrections, right? That was a lot of hands-off coaching, right? I couldn't just get in there. I'm like, I can't make you see it if you don't see it. So there was a lot I had to learn to do. And then now I'm really good at that. There are some t techniques that now I can incorporate into my professional learning seminars with adults to help them have the like aha moment how to create the right amount of cognitive dissonance right not so much that you're like i'm frustrated this is what Vygotsky said he says where is the zone of proximal development and how do i get you into that zone where you like oh my god i see it right it's so it's so interesting you know you're pulling pulling these different things out that maybe some of us who are in education we got bits and pieces, you know, different places, right? You know, your undergrad, you got a bit here and maybe a little in service here, but it's never pulled together, right? It was never really brought together as a way to actually do it. And I, I, it's interesting. I'm just going to read something from uh, the beginning of your book. It, it said, you know, you said just increasing standards and instructional rigor won't reverse this epidemic. Dependent learners cannot become independent learners by sheer willpower. It is not a matter of grit or mindset. They're necessary, but not sufficient by themselves. We have to help dependent students develop new cognitive skills and habits of mind that will actually increase their brain power. And to me, that, that spoke to me as a, as a dad, um, as somebody who works with all kinds of people that we have to work to help them develop their cognitive skills. Is there specific type of practices that we can do to help develop those cognitive skills? Oh, wow. Yeah, then we can do a whole nother podcast on that, right? And that's what I'm actually trying to unpack for people in my uh, upcoming book is a really understanding what that is and how we help students develop this. Because I think you, it goes back to what you just said. We didn't get a lot of that. We got a little bit in that ed psych class and maybe we read a pop book over here and we're stitching it together ourselves. But we don't really understand how it all comes together to either create inequity by design, under educating the most vulnerable kids or equity by design, right? Deliberately making sure that we get those things in that will help them accelerate their own learning. And I think the biggest thing that I try to help educators understand is this is not just, we're going to teach thinking skills and it relates to practice. I actually need kids to develop ways of looking at a task 
and having a mental algorithm. Like when I, here's what we know. The minute you look at something new, you're in confusion. The minute learning gets hard, you're in confusion. First, I have to help you socially, emotionally be okay. Yes, because it triggers our amygdala. We all panic a little. Oh, this is confusing. Or, oh, this is hard. All right, how do you coach a student to that next level, right? And so the cognitive structure, the first cognitive structure, I understand how to size things up, right? And that sizing things up when we look at cognition is really around classification. What is this in front of me? But that means I've internalized some things. Teachers don't teach how to learn, right? Learning how to learn. And back in the day, we did HOTS, higher order thinking skills. And it was a separate curriculum. We're going to teach HOTS over here. And here's our content. Yes. We are now doing social emotional yes. learning and development. It's over here, 15 minutes over here. And then we'll go back to instruction. People don't understand emotions and cognition are linked. So I got to first get myself brain calm and ready. Like, yeah, I'm in confusion now. Right. This should be an exciting right. place to be, right? And now I have to be able to size it up. What is this? Is this relationship? We call these thinking dispositions. Yeah. Then there are habits of mine, right? Yeah. There are things I actually internally move myself through. Here's the, the thing I want to say about that. For the independent learner, these are unconscious things. They don't know that they actually do them. For dependent learners, they know that they can't do them. They see people doing things to the point that their lack of understanding about these invisible cognitive structures, for them, it just means I'm stupid. And if they, particularly black and brown kids, get the dominant narrative that goes along with that, then we just chalk that up to they don't have the intellectual capacity. We know in, intellect is malleable. We can grow parts of our brain power. And so, you know, we have inclinations. People have, you know, can gravitate toward things. There are, are talents that we have, but we all can get smarter. And part of what teachers don't learn in their own process of professional learning in the profession, as well as their training prior to entering the profession is how brains get smarter. What do those structures look like? What's the dojo kids need to be in while they're taking in the new content that actually does that? So yeah, in this new book, that's actually what I'm trying to break down for folks Love. is to understand what those things are and how do we coach them. We have to be students' personal trainer of cognitive development while we're covering our content, right? Yeah. So that at, yeah. it's not, oh, it's over here. It's like, no, the, in the dojo is where you're actually working on your craft, be it Kung Fu or basketball, right? That it's in the midst of that, that the sensei or the coach is going to stop you and say, oh no, kick a little harder, right? I call it the Mr. Miyagi you know, the original karate kid, you know, and he, Daniel comes over and says, Hey, I want to learn karate. And Mr. Miyagi says, okay, yeah, I'll teach you, but first go wax my car, right? right? Wax on, wax on and do it just like this. All right. Uh, and then go paint that fence, right? Like this, this is the stroke. I want you to. unbeknownst to Daniel. He was actually practicing. Yes. He was actually talking about muscle movement so that when it came time to actually do the, he threw the arm up he, and he yelled so that there was that connection. Oh, wax off. Oh, I know how to do that. <laughs> like, our children know more than we give them credit for. They just need to be conscious. You actually know how to do some of that already. Now we're going to refine it. We're going to make it so you can control it. Teachers, you know how to do some of that already. Now we're just going to bring it to the level of consciousness where you could do it for all kids, not for the kids who kind of know it already. And that's really what I'm striving for is helping people, you know, get past the label of culturally responsive. That's confusing. It's misleading. Right now it's just moved into the jargon realm. Right. So I want people to think instead about instructional equity, how are we making sure that all students, particularly the most vulnerable historically marginalized kids get the most powerful teaching that helps grow their brain power. So not just the content to, you know, uh, I mean the, the teaching to, to move through the content, 
but the teaching that actually helps them expand the mental algorithms that allow them to literally level up the amount of content they can take in and process. That's the goal. That's equity in a nutshell. I, I love it you know, because it, it's beyond just a talking point. It's actual an instructional point. Absolutely. And, uh, that's, it's just powerful for me to hear and, and think about in my own practice and own work. You know, I, I typically follow up these conversations with three questions, but you already answered two of them. I was, first question is, what are the misconceptions? You just hit on those misconceptions. <laughs> Uh, the second, the second one is always, um, what are you working on now? I know you're working on this new book about instructional equity. I think we're excited. And when that comes out, we're gonna have to bring you back on because I feel like we could have a whole nother hour long conversation about, about what that looks like. But the final question I want to ask you, uh, is something that I think isn't, is important. Um, and something that we, we try to ask everybody, which is in terms of practice, um, are there resources, are there things that you have found that have helped you get better uh, that you can share with others? So there is just a couple things or maybe one thing that stands out to you um, as a resource that if somebody's listening to this right now and they listen all the way through and they're through the conversation, what is a, what is a resource that they can help get better at their practice? Um, yeah, I think there are a couple of things. You know, I'm a big believer that there is knowledge that we can glean from books. I don't, I'm not sure we can glean practices, but we certainly can get an understanding yeah. of kind of the conceptual pathway to getting better. So um, one that I really like is around deliberate practice. Um, the idea of the talent code, right? The back in the day, a few people were talking about this notion that we get better by deliberate practice. So I think being able to really think about what does that look like? There's a new one out um, uh, and I think it's called retrieval practice and it's really interesting because it talks about how do we actually help students with that myelination by helping them retrieve important information and it may seem trivial to people but a lot of our kids don't know how to hold on to information so their schema is thin and the background knowledge is thin so that's one aspect I think the um, the other aspect is for educators to give themselves more white space, meaning where are you going to do this reading? Where are you going to create your own dojo? And I really want to encourage them to understand it's not a new book I have to get, but it's the new space I have to create. And your district may help you do it. And if your district does not, then you need to be about that for yourself. Do not wait for your district to actually say, oh, well, the district, you have time. There are some things you're going to say no to, and you got to think about what those are going to be. And you got to figure out how, who else can I squat up with? I need to get two, three other teachers, and we need to create our own professional learning community. We need to figure out, pick a focal student that is representative and say, We're gonna, I, I actually want to figure out how to do this better and you're going to actually just suck at it in the beginning and we cannot be doing any more harm to children than we are currently doing so this is it well i got it you keep doing what you're doing you're pretty much guaranteeing that we're harming children the idea of getting better we have grace right there there is something that says we we are not doing harm when we are leveling up and the more we can do that for ourselves the better it can be. So the resources aren't, oh, go out and buy this thing. It's like, give yourself the gift of time. Yeah. Give yourself the gift of a community who yeah. wants to be curious, mm -hmm. right? Give yourself the gift of moving beyond this kind of trite book study. Oh, we're just all doing a book study. I'm not sure when that entered into education that we learn by book study. That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, but <laughs> it has caught on, right? Yeah. It's like, stop yeah. that. Pull a few concepts out, go practice them, right? It, it, it's like trying to become a master chef by watching every cooking show on the Food Network. It's not, it's not going to happen. happen. <laughs> I've tried that. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, and listen, I, I'm so thankful that you were able to come on the podcast today. We will have in the show notes all different types of resources and links to just the, the litany of things that you were uh, describing and talking about today, but where can people find you? Where can they interact with you and your work? Where's the best spot? Yeah. 
they can find me at my um, uh, website, which is crtandthebrain.com. And while I am not blogging right now, um, because I'm writing and, you know, I'm in my own dojo right now. And it's been a minute, you know, I've been traveling, but I've taken a hiatus from traveling and really working on the book. I'm hoping to create my own podcast around implementation uh, of some of these ideas next year after the book is done. Um, so I'm excited about that, but they can, lots of good, um, older blog posts that are still relevant. Um, in addition, they can find me. I've got a closed Facebook group where I come on, try to, to continue to do some sharing of information, do some Facebook lives, and that's uh, Ready for Rigor um, on Facebook. Um, they can find me on Twitter and Instagram as well, Ready for Rigor on Twitter and uh, at CRT in the Brain uh, on Instagram. So yeah, I try to get out there because I think it's so important for us to be in community around these things and for me to share what I can and support teachers and you can ask me questions and because listen, it takes a village. We are not going to do this solo and I understand that. I don't present myself as an expert, but as a, a community member, someone who's passionate about supporting kids and equity and teachers. Well, thank you so much um, just for putting yourself out there, for writing this book, for sharing um, what works and the practices. And I'm excited for the next book. You know, I'm just excited about taking these conversations further and your podcast, uh, but get connected with Zaretta online. Uh, she is, she's out there, she's having conversations. And uh, again, we'll have all the show notes and links. Thanks again so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Very welcome. All right. All right.